in planning for this was in 2020, summer of 2020, we all remember what was happening. The uh, and we recognize the need to take action as a university, as a school of medicine, to um, amplify the efforts around educating future leaders from diverse backgrounds at the School of Medicine and to unify that uh, intentionally, uh, that pathway pipeline of students and trainees uh, to support each other, build community and build leaders. Uh, and that therefore became the Office of Diversity and Medical Education. And that's something I'm so deeply proud of because I, I really firmly believe we're um, touching the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of students through our amazing students, uh, trainees um, that all come through our programs. Yay. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Boxer, we'll just go in order for the first one. Well, I, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I feel like an honorary neurologist neurosurgeon. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a pleasure to see so many people here. Um, I, I guess it's hard for me to pick uh, and talk about one. I mean, I'm really just so delighted and pleased to have worked in many ways, I think, to help uh, women in medicine. But let me just talk um, about one, and uh, Odette can relate to this, which is our Stanford Medicine Leadership Academy uh, that um, the dean and I started. And um, we specifically did it because we wanted to give people with leadership potential an opportunity for a deeper dive and training into leadership, and particularly to go to people like some women, for example, who wouldn't necessarily raise their hands and say, yeah, I'm a leader, I want to be a leader. And very intentional in selecting the group, we asked the chairs to nominate them, but making suggestions and making certain that we have incredible gender and uh, balance in other areas. And it has been just so rewarding to see what these people have done. And in particular, I just think of some of the real standouts who have been women. So hats off to them. We've got one here. <laughs> it's a great program for sure. Thank you. And Dr. Ratliff? Thank you. Um, we're very fortunate to be at Stanford because of leadership and because of what's been accomplished already. So what we have here in terms of resources, in terms of availability with Dr. Steinberg's leadership, with what everything that's been done already locally is just most other facilities don't have that. And I can say as my leadership or my contribution perhaps would be as I've ascended as a national leader in like neurosurgery, I get kind of Teflon and people can't really hurt me because I'm pretty high on like the program. So I can start to subvert norms and make people kind of think about things differently and do stuff that otherwise nationally uh, might not be fully considered. And one of the things we did in the council was work with the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, which is one of our big national organizations, to develop a set of scholarships for medical students. And medical students are interested in neurosciences, interested in neurosurgery, but we really structure those summer scholarships to focus more on DEI, on diversity, on being inclusive, on how can we open the door of neurosurgery? And then how can we welcome more reflective members of society into neurosurgery, which is still primarily a white male specialty, even though medical school admittance rates definitely favor women as you get into neurosurgery applications and neurosurgery residencies, it still kind of skews towards men, which is a definite opportunity for improvement for our specialty. So we had a student from WashU win one of these fellowships, Sangami uh, Pugazinti, She's going to be publishing this soon, but she did an amazing survey of medical students nationwide about barriers to entry in neurosurgery. And then she looked at underrepresented minorities. She looked at women. She looked at where are the opportunities where we can do a better job as neurosurgeons to recruit and to, again, make sure our doors open. And what she found is the number one thing for women and underrepresented minorities was a absence of role models or people that looked like them in their residency environment. They didn't have anybody they could look to and say, I, this person looks like me, their path is like mine, they'll understand me. I see something here that fits with my experience because they don't see that, they choose not to go into neurosurgery. 
-hmm. And that's why, again, like we're so unique here that we have there Odette, is. that we have a Melanie Hayden, that we have Laura Prolo, that we have Dr. Steinberg's leadership for many years in terms of making sure that we have an inclusive department so that we can recruit potential trainees like Gabby and try to pull her into like, <laughs> her, I'm sorry, but to try to keep her here to train again because of like the diversity of our department. But at least nationally, there's a lot of opportunities within neurosurgery to clone this and to try to do the same thing in other departments. And again, part of my national leadership role is to continue to like push that and continue to advocate for those efforts. Awesome. Sorry about talking through so No, awesome vision, awesome say. impact. Be quiet for the rest of the <laughs> Dr. Steinberg, how about you? Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is uh, what we built over um, the 20 years that I was chair of neurosurgery. So I took over here in 1995. And at that time, um, an appalling something like 5% uh, of um, uh, board certified neurosurgeons were women. Um, four point five. There you go. Uh, it's a it's little now better. Five point it, four. It, it's a little better now, but um, and um, believe it or not, nineteen ninety five diversity was not a uh, hot topic. It, 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 people didn't want to talk about it, and I felt very strongly um, that we needed to recruit a more uh, diverse faculty. Um, and resident um, class. We were originally taking one resident a year over um, a number of years. We increased that to three residents a year. Um, so when I took over, we had five faculty um, and um, we grew that over 20 years um, to a faculty of about 63, including um, uh, uh, 35 neurosurgeons and 20 um, research faculty. Um, and I remember the challenges um, of trying to make a concerted effort to recruit women and other represented minorities. And I know Odette remembers this at our uh, faculty meetings and our resident recruit meetings. Um, I would uh, consistently make the point that uh, these two applicants are basically equivalent. I mean, you can't distinguish them in terms of their achievements. They're both superstars, but uh, this one's a woman, or this one is a uh, a, a, a black um, representative, and um, I remember uh, certain faculty saying, "Well, we just want the best person. Why do we have to give extra points to someone who's a woman or an underrepresented minority?" I said, "Because diversity is important. It's important to develop programs. You you want to represent different views." Um, but it was a struggle, and I think um, it's still a struggle. And the point I would make is that we have to continue to make a concerted effort, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, uh, giving extra um, uh, credit um, to, to promote diversity. Yeah. Um, I think it's a lot better. We were able to build a department with about 33% women and other underrepresented minorities. It was the, the, the highest percentage in the country and the same was true of our residents um, over, a, over a period of time. And I remember Lloyd at one of my annual reviews um, and I asked him, what, you know, uh, what do you want me to do? What are you happy about? And we had built, you know, brought on great scientists. We have a Nobel Prize winning scientists in our department. We have a, a uh, uh, a department that is known for clinical excellence in every specialty. Uh, we became from not even on the chart to number two in the country out of more than 100 programs for NIH funding. But what Lloyd said to me, this was a number of years ago, he said, how did you build such a diverse department? And it's really a role model nationally. And so that's one of the things I, as I say, I'm most proud of. Yeah, thank you. I obviously benefited. I, I think what I love about each of your remarks, and I know you all personally, and what you have done is that um, you embrace diversity, but you also do it through the lens of inclusive excellence. So there's no compromise in um, in, in in how you approach people and how you build these programs, and and it reflects in in sort of the careers that uh, we've all had and and the impact we've hopefully made uh, at the institution. So thank you. Uh, my next question, and I'll start with um, Dr. Ratliff, highlight one thing you would change on your path as an advice to people on the same path. So like, what would you do over? <laughs> uh, engage earlier, like in leadership opportunities. Um, early in my career, I 
think I was a little perhaps short-sighted in terms of looking at whether or not becoming a national leader would be worth the investment of time and worth like the effort. And it took me a few years to really get plugged in. And I wish I'd started earlier around that course. And I would think the key is really being able to give back nationally to, for me, neurosurgery. And for me, like the organizations that support like practicing neurosurgery. And I wish I'd started that like earlier. I don't know that I realized um, when I was uh, young and immature, how impactful. <laughs> could be smarter like, when you're younger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Steinberg, and then we'll come back to Dr. Tom. Is this a generic question, or yeah. does it relate to, um, you know, diversity in Either. particular? Either, yeah, or both. You can do both. Um, several things I learned uh, very quickly um, in a leadership role. Um, one was, I think it's very important to uh, uh, live off reflected glory. So when you become uh, any kind of leader, um, you want to avoid the tendency to um, focus on yourself. It's not all about you. And I think that's sometimes difficult to do. Um, I think another thing I learned quickly was um, uh, you must listen. And I remember as a um, medical student, when we got videotaped at our first clinical um, interview uh, with, a, with a patient and uh, Mike Jacobs, Remember Mike Jacobs in uh, uh, primary care? He he said, you did great. You, you were very thorough and everything, but you talk too much. <laughs> and and that made an impression on me. And, and, I, and I've tried to uh, become a good listener because you want to understand other people's point of view um, and, um, and try to um, uh, develop uh, an approach based on um, what you think other people are, uh, uh, are feeling, what their needs are. So I think those are two lessons I learned um, over time. Well said, yeah. Dr. Thomas? Two lessons as well. My first, uh, it's okay to be uncomfortable, but get used to being uncomfortable with being the one or only in the room making the decisions and advocating for what you most believe in. Uh, and second would be never do it alone, you know, uh, go in with your board of advisors, trusted partners, collaborators that you could reach out to, um, get advice from and use their strength to help guide you in important decisions that you make for yourself and for your career and do the same for others. Oh, lovely. That's Dean Boxer. Thanks. Um, okay, so I thought the question was, what would I have done differently? Yeah. And I, I have to say, I, I just love what I do, and it's hard for me to imagine. So I guess the one thing I would say is, at some point, I think Gary touched on this, there's this transition from, oh, it's not just about me, it's about helping others. And um, I think when you, you're, you're a physician and you're leading a research team, you know, you make that transition because you're working with people who, you know, you want to help their careers. And at some point I realized, oh my gosh, I could do this more broadly. And I was able to do that from my role as chief of hematology. So I guess maybe I'm thinking, how could I realize that even earlier? Because as I went along, it turns out what gives me the most satisfaction is really helping others and particularly helping people who I've you know, I don't see a lot of them, like women, like underrepresented in medicine, and just making a special, special effort for that. But other than that, this has been great. <laughs> I love that theme, be, be smarter sooner. Um, <laughs> and help more people, which, which is why we came to medicine in the first place, right? Um, thank you all. And then I have one more question for the panel then we'll go to rapid fire what what's what are you most what is your proudest accomplishment in madison let's see i started with you you okay dr boston oh, okay <laughs> wow that's hard um i i guess just thinking back um you know when i uh when i started as an md phd it stanford was an amazing place stanford really is an amazing place 
And it never, ever occurred to me that I could be a faculty member here, let alone a leader here. And again, it's not about, oh, great, look what I've done. It's about what I hope has been a positive impact on so many people. And to me, that is, um, that's what it's all about. Yeah. How about um, you, Rena? Dr. Thomas, sorry. <laughs> I think uh, there's a tendency to fit a certain mold within medicine. Um, and I think I'm proud that I really try to break that mold uh, and and really uh, focus in the education space, but also in the scientific and clinical advancement space. So I hope that that can also inspire others to do the same. Okay. How about you, Dr. Stenberg? I would say um, probably my greatest accomplishment uh, are the um, people I've trained, um, both at a uh, faculty level, a resident level, a postdoctoral fellowship level, and that includes um, clinical um, trainees and as well as research trainees. I see some of both here today. Um, but that gives me the, the greatest pleasure is uh, because that's the future, really. I mean, I'm 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 old guy now, so I'm not going to be around too long. But um, it's uh, motivating people um, to really uh, achieve the the best that they can. And these are the people who are going to make the new discoveries and um, you know uh, new pioneer new innovations, and they're going to be the ones who are going to teach. Uh, the next generation of leaders. So I would say that's what I'm uh, most proud of. Excellent. And Dr. Ratliff? So you stole my answer and probably said it better than I, <laughs> I would have ago. So it's like all right, let's have a two over. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I guess two things. First of all, uh, just being here mm -hmm. and being on this panel. I mean, I, I'm pretty proud of that. That I've done something right that you felt compelled to like include me with this August group. I'm pretty proud of that. And also, just like Dr. Steinberg said, like trainees. And when you train someone and then you see them going out and becoming a faculty member, and then they are training additional neurosurgeons, and you're able to see that roll forward into the next generation, you really see how your impact um, is amplified. Much more than the patient too that helps an individual, you're training individuals who go up and help additional patients. And that, when I say train the next generation, you just see like a multiplication of your impact as a nurse, which is, you know, as you have noted. And that's very unique. And I think a wonderful part of being an academician. Excellent. Thank you. I'm mindful of time. And so we're going to spend another like maybe five to seven more minutes with what I'm going to call rapid fire questions. You don't have to think about them deeply. Um, we're just, they're lighter questions just to get you to know you better. Um, the first is, um, if you, if this weren't your career, what would you be doing? <laughs> Anybody? I'd, I'd be a veterinarian. I thought for a long time about that. I'd live somewhere out in the country and I'd have horses and dogs and, you know, it's a, it's a nice notion. Never happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd be playing trumpet, which is something I took up recently after stepping down as chair. I Never thought I could make it um, as a as a professional trumpet player, but uh, as Gabby knows, I've, I've uh, really been enjoying playing uh, in the Stanford Medical Orchestra and and practicing every day. So it's uh, I love uh, uh, you know I love playing music. Dr. Ratliff? I have no idea. I'd be someplace I like, very frustrated and unhappy because I wouldn't be doing like what I love. I don't think I could like really you do be not want him unhappy. Like, you know, I'm I'm very pleased with where I am. So I can't think of anything I would rather be doing. And Rena? In eighth grade, I did a report around how to become an Olympic swimmer, which I don't know <laughs> if anyone's seen me in the pool lately. Uh, that that's but and I don't know how I would build a career around that either. But I I guess I Endorse. I do get to um, work out with the master's swim team here at Stanford. <laughs> All right, with that, what's your superpower? I think connecting with others. I, I, I think getting to know them as people, getting to know what make motivates them and hopefully um, encouraging them to follow that that path. 
Anyone else? Well, I was going to say something somewhat similar to Rena, which is that um, I I find it incredibly helpful when I'm talking to someone to put myself in their place and try to think, okay, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? How best can I understand them? How best can I help them? I don't know if it's a superpower, but it's something I'm working on. <laughs> John? I don't have a superpower or not. Um, maybe communication. People generally kind of know what I'm thinking, and I'm relatively clear with making that, like, or making those points evident. Okay. I don't know if it's a superpower, but um, one thing that, that I, I think has helped me over many years um, is um, uh, possessing a certain energy level, uh, being able to prioritize um, uh, and to compartmentalize uh, different activities, I think uh, enables has enabled me to accomplish um, things that um, I might not have been able to. And what's your favorite book? Um, you know, I've been actually um, reading a bunch of biographies by Walter Isaacson recently. And when I say reading, I found out I can listen to them uh, on audiobooks when I'm driving to and from work. And it's amazing how much time that is. So I started with Leonardo da Vinci, that biography, and then read his Ben Franklin um, and uh, Steve Jobs. And I'm now reading, um, there, I think he's a great biographer because he, he, he has a, a wonderful understanding of the science and the culture and the art, but he also brings out the personal aspects. And I'm right now reading The Code Breaker about Jennifer Doudna, who just won the Nobel Prize for CRISPR. Um, and uh, so those have been my, my fa favorite books recently. Very cool. How about you, Rena? I'm reading right now Covenant of Water, uh, which is amazing. I trying to get through it though <laughs> without with, with, while also doing my day job you know <laughs> Dr. well i i was going to put in a pitch for my favorite books by abraham Verghese. after all he's a member of my department and so yeah. <laughs> you know i just so admire someone who can be an amazing physician person and an incredible author yeah how about you john i mean last book i read was like chain gang all stars we put in a huge pub for that like fantastic like modern novel i don't know if it's like favorite of all time or not i'd probably go back to like dice to fc or like oh anna karenina like, like yeah. favorites but that's my favorite no time to read those poems anymore, <laughs> like work. um all right and now what what mobile app do you use the most dr boxer Oh, you are asking the wrong person. Yeah. <laughs> Probably just by email because I can't yeah. be away from it. <laughs> Rena? Oh my goodness. Same answer. Um, <laughs> they are so old. Yeah. I just spent the night in the OR with a bunch of young people, quote unquote, and I learned all these new things. Like I learned uh, RIS, like uh, charisma. Is that what you call RIS? And I learned... Um, uh, what was the other word I learned? Oh, drip, like to be dripping. Um, <laughs> so I'm like way up to speed now on apps. <laughs> These are all like, like, you know, on apps. And so, so we are super so old, think clearly. People say for yeah. 200. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're way not your target audience. Yeah. But in any case, what about you, Dr. Steinberg? This is a bad group to ask about apps. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Um, do any of you have um, a mindfulness practice? It can be exercise. It can be religious. It could be like anything that you feel. Yeah, if you want to call it that, I don't always think of it that way, but I get up every morning early so that I can do a workout. And it is, it's just a great opportunity to sort of let my uh, thoughts flow. And I find that if I start my day without that, it's not such a great day. <laughs> Anyone else want to share? Yeah, yeah, for me, it's meditating. I mean, I dabbled in meditation, like completely lost it as I became like an attending physician. And then like, as I've gotten like <laughs> mid middle age, as opposed to early middle age, like, <laughs> Or I old is what we call it. it. Right. I mean, um, 
I, mean, I did like a meditation retreat at like Spirit Rock for like a week, like in the fall, which I never ever would have imagined actually doing. I mean, it was really like transformative for me to get back to like meditation and sort of deep practice and just really helping my effectiveness. Amazing. How about you, Dr. Samuel? Uh I used to be an avid runner and um and that was important to me. I still like running, but it's become uphill more like hiking these days. <laughs> um but um, I don't do it every day, but um, I do practice trumpet every day now because, as some of you know, trumpet's an instrument, uh, unlike piano or or even string instruments or even wind, woodwind, where uh, it's a muscle. And if you don't practice uh, almost every day, you lose the high tones, you lose your, a decent tone. And it's something um, I do it often uh, at the end of the day. And it's usually when I do it. If I get out of the OR even at 11 at night or midnight, I'll practice in my office because there's very few people around. And it's funny if I'm tired, I think, do I really want to do this? But once I start playing, I, I really enjoy it. And it's become a, uh, a nice end of the day before going home um, to play 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, and I play it with, you know, uh, downloaded music. I played jazz for myself, which I never played as a kid. And now you can download, um, you know, a great jazz quartet or quintet minus the lead trumpet player. So I can play the Miles Davis part or the you know, Lee Morgan part. So that's kind of become a routine for me. Love it. Love it. And Rena, we'll close out with you. A routine that we started is family reading time. So we each get our own books um, at the end of the day, just before bedtime, and try to read together at the same time our own books. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to any questions that you might have. If not, we'll close it. Anyone have a question for the panel? And you can ask anything. Sure. They have to answer. <laughs> we'll start with Odessa. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Was it then? It was 4.5% board certified in neurosurgery where women. Right. Yeah. Well, well, did you have a question? Uh, it's no, 5.4 so the last time that they took it, but it's board certified. So the caveat is that we have a lot of women in training and um, neurosurgery has has some attrition, both men and women. Um, and board certification is not the same as other specialties. It's something that happens after. Right. It takes a few years, but there are many more women in the pipeline. Many women. It's something uh, but, like 20%. Yeah, but unfortunately, neurosurgery is still a very white male dominated profession. And I've always uh, ha had problems with that. Yeah. Um, and um, it is changing, but we need to, I think, change it, change it quicker. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's changing, but he's 100% correct. And in fact, Gabby, who um, we just published a paper on this um, a month ago, two months ago, I don't know. Um, and in some, in some uh, underrepresented minority groups, we've actually lost ground, mm -hmm. like meaning less people now than 10 years ago. So it, it's still a work in progress, but I think the efforts of people like Steinberg and Dr. Ratliff and in the neuro, it, this is not just neurosurgery, like the neurosciences in general. And then in academic medicine, one of the reasons Dr. Boxer's role is so vital is because what we see is that, you know, you have the, med someone talked about the medical schools being at, at parity with women somewhat dominating, but then when you look at deans, like she stands alone, right? I mean, it's sort of, I mean, well, well Rena's a dean also, but yeah. you know, it, it becomes, it's like this inverse, it's like this triangle, right? And so you have all these women, but they're not deans, they're not chairs, they're not. So it's still, a, it's still an effort. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? You guys, come on. <laughs> no, <laughs> wanna ask? Oh, someone, sorry, speak up, go ahead. Wow, that's excellent. Did you guys hear that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, passion, yeah. commitment, positivity, optimism. I think that's so important in a leader. Um, I think you've heard communication, listening, even more important, and um, not being afraid to take some risks going out there. You know, this it comes up when we interview um, residents, as an example. And 
many years ago, I thought it was most important that they were brilliant and had all these great accomplishments and um, were driven. Uh, but I've concluded over many years, the most important aspect is the character of, of a person. What kind of because all of the people who apply have these they're all ambitious and they're all very well accomplished and super smart and talented and energetic but uh character is something maybe um maybe it's developed over you know over a short period of time by the time you're uh applying to residency it's um it, it it's going to be tough to change that um and these are people not only who are going to be with you for seven years of training in neurosurgery, uh, but you know they're going to go on uh, future careers. And I think um, being a good person, having high ethical values, um, being compassionate, all those make up character. And I think that's the most important uh, feature. Thank you. Thank you for your question and for your answer. If any, if you guys want to add, you can. If not. Um, any any other questions? I'll, ask, I'll I'll have room for one more if you guys would like. Yes. Oh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a balancing act, you know. I think there are so many priorities on your time um, as a woman, as a mother, as a faculty member, as a mentor. And having passion and energy are really important, but recognizing that it's a team, right? So nothing I do, I do without uh, an, without the, an entire group of collaborators, of the team members, and um, making sure that you make time for everyone to shine in their skill set is really key. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. It's about balance. It's about prioritizing. It's about being efficient. And, you know, it, it really bothers me still when I talk to women in training who say, oh, I want to do this career in academic medicine. So I realize that means I can't have a family. I can't have children. I'm like, no, no, don't even go there. You absolutely can have it all. You've just really got to be committed and want to do it. And then I think it is um, also so important showing others behind us that it is possible, helping them reaching out. I mean, let's close on that note because that's incredibly powerful. Um, there have been some incredible themes today. Uh, be smarter sooner is my favorite. <laughs> um, you know, and mentoring is key and um, access. And I, each, as you guys, I hope um, from today, you will join me in understanding just how incredible these four individuals are in changing the face of medicine, not just at Stanford, but um, I would argue uh, changing the face of medicine, period. Um, please uh, join me in applauding them and thanking them for taking their time. And we have these little gift bags. Oh, we get more than this. <laughs> Thank and you. Um, it's time for you guys to just meet each other, um, say hello. You can come and get autographs. Uh, <laughs> It'll cost. Uh, <laughs> but thank you all for joining us. Thanks again, Wait. Dan, for your um, for inspiring this event, and uh, thanks again to our coordinator and our chairs. All right, take care. <laughs> Too